Discovering Alabama is a production of the Alabama Museum of Natural History. October 1492. Three ships have been at sea for weeks. The crewmen are restless, eager for the long-awaited glimpse of shore. And then, a surprising encounter. Great flocks of birds pass endlessly through the evening hours. Christopher Columbus records the event in his journal, unaware that he is nearing America and witnessing one of nature's grandest wildlife phenomena. The annual flight south of America's millions of migratory birds. As Columbus sailed to the New World, many of the feathered flocks heading south winged their way over a land that would become known as Alabama. Five hundred years after the arrival of Columbus, we can only imagine the full scope of wildlife he must have witnessed. For with the discovery of the New World came the beginning of the end for many magnificent American creatures. Even the proud symbol of our nation would eventually be pushed to near extinction. But today, here in the mountain lake terrain of northern Alabama, the bald eagle is making a comeback and becoming a symbol for what our nation can do when we all work together for wildlife conservation. And among the regions holding the greatest promise for the bald eagle's recovery is our own state of Alabama. I'm Doug Phillips. Join me for a look at Alabama's wildlife heritage and at the significant role our state has played and can continue to play in conserving that heritage for generations to come. This program is about a land unknown to many people, a land that in many ways has escaped the hustle and bustle of modern civilization, a place with bountiful backcountry, forests, streams, and wildlife more diverse than can be found in much of the inhabited world. Come along with me as we explore the natural wonders of this land. Come along as we discover Alabama. Welcome to Discovering Alabama. In our modern America of accelerating change and expanding urban society, Alabama is increasingly recognized for its abundance of wildlife. For our wealth of game animals, such as white-tailed deer, wild turkey, dove, and trophy bass, and for a remarkable variety of non-game creatures, from familiar critters like the bluebird, to rare species like the flattened musk turtle. And Alabama's abundant wildlife isn't found just in amusement parks and petting zoos, but in the wild. In this state, we can still witness these creatures in their natural habitat. From the Appalachian mountain country of the north to the coastal regions of the south, Alabama boasts numerous forest communities plus many wetlands and river systems that add up to a wide range of habitats supporting a great diversity of plants and animals. Sportsmen know very well how important quality habitat is to ensure healthy populations of game animals and fish. Ample natural habitat is critically important for the more rare and specialized species. For instance, the bald eagle is making a comeback in Alabama because of great tracts of wild land with large bodies of water that the eagle needs for feeding, ranging, and nesting. While other parts of the nation continue to lose such natural surroundings, Alabama provides unique sanctuary and provides us with unique opportunities to maintain our wildlife heritage. Since long before Columbus, mankind has sought wildlife for basic needs, such as food, clothing, and recreation. But today, many Alabamians are realizing that our need for wildlife extends beyond these values. 
Part of the joy and wonder of living in Alabama is the interaction with wild critters. Our sharing of the land with wildlife has become part of our culture, part of the tradition and character of who we are as a people. Alabamians can enjoy this special status because the state has been a leader in efforts to perpetuate wildlife resources. But to fully understand where we are today, we need to also understand where we've come from in the past. After Columbus, many others followed. They came to settle an America rich in resources. The writings and renderings of early naturalists reveal a land of allure with much natural appeal in the region of Alabama. We had things such as bison, uh, elk, beavers, uh, uh, cougars, red wolves, uh, as well as uh, white-tailed deer, wild turkey, uh, or less common species such as uh, fiber-billed woodpeckers, parakeets, uh, migratory species that wintered here, such as passenger pigeons. The same things that drew the primitive uh, Americans here were the same things that eventually would attract uh, the European frontiersmen. This tied in with this idea of manifest destiny where uh, Americans felt like it, they were destined to subdue wild North America. Armed with the doctrine of manifest destiny, Pioneers pushed their way across the continent to the west, the north, and the south. America's wild lands and wildlife were subdued in their wake. Forests were felled, farms and towns tamed the land, and domesticated livestock replaced indigenous creatures. The need to supply the young nation's demand for protein gave rise to the market hunter. Since there were no game laws, the market hunter was unrestricted in his pursuit of meat, furs, and hides. Whole populations of wildlife were decimated. By the mid-1800s, Alabama was headed for a destiny parallel to that of much of the nation. Bison, elk, bear, wolves, and cougars fled the region or were killed. Deer and turkey were reduced to remnant populations. With the uh, increased pressures on habitat and the disappearance of habitat, uh, the, the disappearance of wildlife became so complete that from the period of 1850 to 1900, this period of time is often referred to as the age of extermination. The age of extermination. Sounds ominous, doesn't it? Imagine Alabama devoid of much of our wildlife. Seems almost impossible. Yet, that's where the whole country was headed in the late 1800s. But a number of Americans spoke out against the exploitation of nature. Thomas Cole, for example, lamented that Americans had inherited Eden, but because of their folly could soon lose the garden. George Perkins Marsh argued that the earth had been given to man for stewardship and not for thoughtless consumption and waste. As early as the 1850s, Henry David Thoreau proposed the establishment of nature preserves, where, in his words, the bear, the panther, and the hunter can exist and not be civilized off the face of the earth. Among the first to launch an organized campaign to save America's wildlife was a group describing itself as a club of American hunting riflemen. This group was founded in 1887 as the Boone and Crockett Club. The group's leader was 24-year-old Theodore Roosevelt. On one of his visits out west, Roosevelt became friends with ardent naturalist John Muir, founder of the Sierra Club. Roosevelt and his Boone and Crockett Club and Muir and his Sierra Club soon joined in common pursuit of preserving some of America's last splendid wildlands, like Yellowstone National Park. When Teddy Roosevelt became president in 1901, he appointed Gifford Pinchot to supervise the nation's new system of forest reserves. Pinchot actually coined the term of, used to define rational use of our natural resources, and he developed this term called conservation. Nestled in Alabama's Tennessee Valley, this is Wheeler Wildlife Refuge, one of several such federal refuge areas in the state. Though the term refuge suggests a protected preserve, 
the National Wildlife Refuge System was begun by Teddy Roosevelt to go beyond protecting wildlife to actively restoring wildlife. Protection, recovery, sustainable use. Conservation was a term and a concept right for its time and right for our time. Here at the Wheeler Wildlife Refuge, you can see Pinchot and Roosevelt's definition of conservation at work. In promoting a refuge system, parks, forest reserves, and other measures, Theodore Roosevelt spawned a new awareness that for years afterward would find support among responsive states, including Alabama. Roosevelt wanted a team approach. He wanted the federal government doing their share and the states doing uh, their share at their own individual level. And there were, there were as James Trefedlin, the author of American Crusade for Wildlife, a, a famous hit conservation historian, said there were real giants among the uh, pygmies out there in terms of leadership at the state level. And uh, we had, Alabama was important at, in, at this point. We had I.T. Quinn, an early com commissioner of game here in Alabama, was one of the giants that Trefedlin talked about, about setting up a state conservation system that uh, other state that was so good that, uh, and progressive that other states would emulate it later on. The efforts to save America's wildlife gained a tremendous boost with the election of President Franklin Delano Roosevelt in the 1930s. The FDR years saw New Deal programs like the Civilian Conservation Corps, plus the creation of federal and state agencies for land, water, and wildlife conservation. And like Teddy Roosevelt, who had sought the wisdom of John Muir and Gifford Pinchot, Franklin Roosevelt drew upon the advice of two conservationists as well. Publisher J.N. Ding Darling, appointed chief of the Bureau of Biological Survey, and forester Aldo Leopold, recognized nationally as a leading authority on wildlife. Ding Darling and Aldo Leopold came up with the idea of uh, developing a training program for the wildlife biologists in the country, which eventually became known as the Cooperative Fish and Wildlife Research Unit program. And Alabama figures in prominently in the history of this uh, uh, concept too, because Auburn University was the site of uh, one, one of the, these first 10 chosen sites to house a training program here in the Southeast. With growing support from new groups like the National Wildlife Federation, and the Audubon Society. Many joined the cause of conservation, and momentum began to build. Soon there were new laws. Two landmark laws were the Duck Stamp, or Migratory Bird Act, and the Pittman-Robertson, or Wildlife Restoration Act, which made it possible to receive substantial contributions for wildlife conservation from hunters, from sportsmen, through the sales of outdoor equipment, hunting licenses, and other means. As wildlife conservation became established across America, Alabama has been both a leader and a prime beneficiary. Here in the rolling hills of the upper coastal plain, down about the middle of the state, we're in one of the more than 30 wildlife management areas set aside across Alabama for the benefit of wildlife and for the public enjoyment of wildlife. This one-acre food plot has been sowed in several varieties of plants. Some late clover, for example, that are a favorite of deer. And in the woods adjacent to us is a stand of longleaf pines, being protected because they are home to a group of red cockaded woodpeckers and endangered species. All around us in this wildlife management area, careful planning and oversight ensures the availability of food, water, and cover for many wildlife game and non-game species. Much of Alabama's progress in wildlife management has occurred during the tenure of Charles Kelly, the longest serving active director of game and fish in America. Right now we have 34 wildlife management areas and we have two uh, sanctuaries and the total acres in that is about 713,000 acres. But I grew up in Elmo County, and we didn't have a deer or a turkey in Elmo County even at the time I finished high school. Back when the wildlife population got down, I mean way down, there was five or six people in the state that come to my mind. 
Colonel Allison over in Sumter County, and they had Ben Radcliffe and Tony Slade and Captain Ed Powell and Fred Stimson. But they got together, I mean, they worked individually as a group to regenerate an effort to, to have wildlife conservation. And it's to them that we owe a great debt. My granddaddy was a, uh, a hardwood logger. Uh, Captain Ed Powell, everybody called him. He put together, he and his brother put together a sizable track of land. He loved turkeys, not to hunt, just uh, to have. And uh, uh, he really uh, put a lot of effort into, into protecting game, especially the turkey that he, he liked so much. My daddy carried that on, and uh, I'm trying to do the same. And Alabama conservationists were leaders in bringing others together for the cause of reclaiming America's wildlife heritage. The Alabama Wildlife Federation was formed in 1935, and the people that formed it uh, were very instrumental in the formation of the National Wildlife Federation in 1936. We had many prominent Alabamians, Alabama conservationists who played dominant roles in the, in the leadership of the National Wildlife Federation for many years. George Averett, uh, Walter Mims, uh, Claude Kelly. And so they perceived that if they could put together an umbrella group that would represent people from all over the state. And these, this group included uh, garden club ladies, uh, boys clubs, 4-H clubs, any kind of hunting clubs. And they felt that they could have a wider and more effective role in state government and they put together a coalition of, of men and women across the state began to have an effective role you know in the politics of conservation so alabama has its niche in the uh, the history of the, the comeback of wildlife in america alabama's niche in the history of wildlife is one we can be proud of our love of the outdoors gave us a first-hand knowledge of the dwindling numbers of wild creatures and prompted Alabama landowners to provide animals for restocking depleted wildlife populations throughout much of the region. The inspiration and leadership of conservation-minded Alabamians has made a tremendous impact. For example, in 1940, there were only about 16,000 white-tailed deer in the state. Today, Alabama's white-tailed deer population numbers more than one and a half million. From the majestic mountains of the north to the remarkable wetlands of the coastal area, Alabama has a uniquely rich variety of habitat for wildlife. The state has been a leader in helping restore declining wildlife populations of the past. Today, ongoing programs such as the Forever Wild Program, the state's deer management program, and the non-game wildlife program, these serve as models of successful wildlife enhancement. The many achievements of wildlife conservation don't mean the job is complete. The modern conservationist realizes that while we celebrate the restoration efforts of the past, we must keep an eye on the needs of the present. Let's look at what's going on in the United States. We are becoming an increasingly urbanized society. We don't have any real experience of the environment outside of the urban or suburban setting. Um, what, we're, what we're dealing with here is, is a kind of environmental illiteracy. Um, kids don't really, and, and adults too, don't really often understand the impact of human activity on the environment and what can be done to, you know, sort of balance human activities and, and the need to protect the environment. On the national level, National Wildlife has, uh, Federation has tried to provide support through our Backyard Wildlife Habitat Program, and Alabama Wildlife Federation is now developing a schoolyard habitat program too. What the Federation has tried to do is act as a Federation, pull together this fragmentation of all the organizations which basically want to see environmental education in Alabama. They want to see an environmentally literate population to try to work in a cohesive manner to develop a plan, uh, utilize that plan, implement it, and bring about uh, a better educated student that realizes how important uh, the environment is to them and how that we've all got to live and work and exist on this planet. As generations of Alabamians are removed from the farm, conservation-minded educators want to be sure we still understand man's link to nature. 
Innovative environmental education programs are doing just that. This year we are doing a year-long curriculum that integrates science, social studies, math, and language arts into areas that we can uh, use an environmental theme to drive this curriculum and let children learn what they need to learn through this resource. We're drawing from many of the quality enrichment resources that have already been put on the market, but we're pulling them together into a very sequential curriculum that allows our children to be able to study the forest resources, water, and wildlife. Alabamians delight in their coexistence with the creatures of the wild. We take great pride in our state's allure for sportsmen, great joy in sharing our wildlife heritage with our children. Now, how do we make sure we can pass this heritage on to future generations? An increasing human population, expanding urbanization, and many other changes pose new threats to wildlife. We have a serious problem with loss of wildlife habitat in Alabama due to the altering of our native forests and the conversion of wetlands uh, through large uh, parts of Alabama. President Teddy Roosevelt once said that if you're going to uh, uh, own property, be a good steward of those lands for the public purpose. The Sierra Club's founder, John Muir, taught us that humankind is a part of the web of life. If we don't wake up to the need for, for good habitat and, and, uh, and good control of what's out there in the way of how we hunted and so forth, we're going to be in serious trouble. And not only will we lose the right to hunt, because we can lose it relatively easy, we're going to lose the economics of, of hunting and fishing, and that's a tremendous asset. My main concern for the future is that our, our children learn about a good conservation ethic and what that will mean for uh, other generations. One thing we've got to do is we, we've got to pull together. We've got to seek ways to find common ground. It all comes back to the land. If we can't protect this land, uh, the land supports everything. It's going to take us all. If we don't uh, work together and work together soon, we stand in grave danger of losing uh, the natural heritage which is so special about our state and which makes living in Alabama such a special experience. The history of wildlife conservation in Alabama and America is a study in cooperation. From the early days of Teddy Roosevelt's Boone and Crockett Club and John Muir's Sierra Club to the modern example of sportsmen working with Alabama educators, wildlife conservation is proof of what we can accomplish working together. Over a hundred years ago, a wise Indian chief warned our forefathers that if all the animals were gone, men would die from a great loneliness of spirit. This Indian chief lived at a time known as the age of extermination. Today, we live in an era known as the age of information. But our expanding modern society is bringing new problems for wildlife. Game laws, public lands, and government programs can do only so much. Today, the most important requirement of wildlife, good habitat, is under new pressure from a rapidly growing human population. Changes like accelerating growth and development pose new problems for wildlife at the end of this century, even as the market hunters did at the turn of the century. We can use our information age computers, technologies, and science as we look for answers. But our best hope for continuing our wildlife heritage is for all of us, hunters, hikers, nature lovers, teachers, business and political leaders. We must all become conservationists. Working together, we can ensure that there will never be a great loneliness of spirit across this land we call Alabama. Thanks for joining us on this visit among Alabama's wildlands and wildlife. Please send any comments or inquiries to Discovering Alabama at this address.
This program is supported by grants from Legacy, Partners in Environmental Education, Champion International Corporation, Reynolds Metals Company, and Booksome, encouraging people to pick up a book and 